Hi, I'm William Ibanez, creator of Blazing Quantum, and as a fellow Patreon supporter, I'm helping you bring this episode. For the quality comics criticism and great creator interviews that the Comics Alternative provides, you should consider becoming a Patreon supporter as well. This is the Comics Alternative Interviews, a conversation with Theo Ellsworth. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Comics Alternative Interviews. I'm Derek. And I'm Gwen, and we're two people with PhDs talking about comics. That's right. And on this episode of the interview show, we're going to be talking with Theo Ellsworth. His book, The Understanding Monster Book 3, was released last fall from Secret Acres. But before we get into that fun conversation, we want to let all of you guys know that this episode of the Comics Alternative Interviews is brought to you by the great folks at Discount Comic Book Service. Go to their website, dcbservice.com, for all of your comics pre-ordering needs. There you're going to find all DC, Marvel, Image, and Dark Horse titles at 40% off of the cover price if you pre-order. For all of the other publishers, you'll find that those discounts are 20 to 35% off cover price. And every single month, you're going to find some wonderful specials. And sometimes those specials will be at 45% off cover price, sometimes at 50% off, but often the discounts are higher than that. That's right, Derek, and this month they have all DC and Marvel hardcover and tradebacks, um, 50% off. So that's a really deep discount, and I'm just going to put in a plug for my favorite kids bundle with Scooby-Doo. Of course. <laughs> of course, for just two ninety eight. That's right, Gwen. There are a lot of great bundles uh, this month at DCB Service, enough to make you go rut row. <laughs> That's DCBService.com. Go there for all of your comics pre-ordering needs. And after you do get your comics there, please be sure to send those guys an email and tell them that Gwen and Derek sent you. That's right, Derek. And you know, when I'm sitting down with my Scooby-Doo comic, you know what? I like to have something to drink. And what kind of things do you like to drink, Gwen? Well, I'll tell you what. Coffee. Coffee. <laughs> and I know of a great place to get it, and that is our other sponsor for this episode, and that is Just Coffee Co-op. They have all sorts of different kind of coffees. All of it is 100% fair trade, shade-grown, and organic certified. They roast to order, and they do so in small batches. No mass production whatsoever. Yeah, and you know, if you want a lovely discount, you just go to justcoffee.coop, C-O-O-P, and place your order. And when you're in the checkout page, under your coupon, just type in the word COMICS, all in caps, C-O-M-I-C-S, and you'll get 10% off. That's right. It's a great deal, and shipping is always free. So that's Just Coffee Co-op. It's a great place to get caffeinated. <laughs> Gwen, we had a great conversation with Theo Ellsworth talking about the Understanding Monster series, not just book three that came out last fall. We also talked a bit about capacity. But another thing that is notable about this episode is this is the first time you and I have tag teamed on an interview together. That's right. And it was so much fun. It was. I, I really enjoyed listening to Theo and I loved these books. They're so beautiful. Yes. Uh, you know, someone can listen to this podcast, epi podcast episode and get a sense of what the book's about, but really, you can't really feel what we're trying to get across through words unless you have the text in front of you. Just beautiful art, rich color. Uh, we strongly recommend that you go out and get a copy of The Understanding Monster. Uh, but in the meantime, you can listen to this interview. That's right. And, you know, you were talking about how much your wife got drawn into it. I was just walking through the living room and my mom saw the cover and grabbed it from me and started reading it. So it really is that mesmerizing. So yeah. please go out and, and pick it up. It's a wonderful book. OK, well, let's uh, let's let our listeners listen to what we talked about with Theo.
We're pleased to have on the comics alternative Theo Ellsworth. His book, The Understanding Monster, book three, came out in September of last year. And the month after that, a new edition of his book, Capacity, was released by Secret Acre. Theo, thank you very much for being on the Comics Alternative. Thanks for having me here. You know, you were at SPX uh, in September, weren't you? Uh, I was, yeah. Yes, and I remember seeing what I thought was you over at the Secret Acres table, and I intended to come by and talk with you. Never got around to it, unfortunately. And that was right around the time that Understanding Monster 3 came out. So I'm you know, glad to get you on the show to discuss this. Now, now, starting with Understanding Monster, if you could describe to our uh, our listeners, uh, to the uninitiated, uh, what is uh, your book's The Understanding Monster? Um, and it's one of those books that I always kind of failed the elevator speech with. Um, <laughs> it sort of felt like a, a living thing when I was working on it, I guess you could say. Um, it's definitely uh, kind of an inner space odyssey. Like, uh, I sort of let my subconscious uh, dictate the story to me, um, and it just sort of wove all these different directions, um, and sort of the process was um, trying to follow that and let it be what it was, well, at the same time, uh, trying to learn what it had to show me and rein it in enough to actually bring it to some kind of conclusion. Um, it was definitely kind of a personal psychological experiment, I guess, just letting it um, kind of grow as a, kind of a natural growth, I guess. To describe the story, I guess it's, um, it's kind of, I kind of gave all these different um parts of my own subconscious, different characters, and I was trying to um, pull them all together and kind of understand how my own imagination worked, um, my relationship to all that. Well, Theo, it's absolutely beautiful, the texts. Um, I'm holding on to one of them now, and it's not a standard size that most people might be used to looking at. Could you talk to us a little bit about um, how you wanted your comic to look? Um, it sort of it sort of just happened by accident. Um, the original page sizes are 11 by 14, which I'm, I'm used to drawing tiny. I've, I've always worked really small sizes. It'll fit mm-hmm. my backpack, and I can take anywhere and be mobile with them. Um, and to me, 11 by 14 was working gigantic. Yeah. I, felt like I, had, the, I had this huge space. I've been talking to other cartoonists. They're like, oh, that's tiny compared to what I do. But for me, I, it was suddenly... Like I had this vast landscape on every page that I had to figure out how to navigate. Um, and then the size of the book just ended up being kind of the natural size that it needed to be to not be too cumbersome, to not be too small, to not be able to take in the details. Well, it's it's just lovely to look at. <laughs> Yes, and speaking of the details, uh, you know, I'm not going to even ask how long it takes to create one of the understanding monster, the understanding monster uh, books, but but how around how long does it take to uh, to do just one page? Because for for, for our listeners uh, who um, aren't familiar with your work, and and we'll put some of the the sample art up in the show notes. I mean, your illustrations are very intricate, and you meticulously illustrate them, the, the cross-hatching, the coloring, and the understanding monster especially. It just seems like it would take forever to complete a page. Um, I, I definitely spend my time on them. Um, I don't know. I, I kind of, I've always been a doodler. That's just like drawing doodles on the sides of math assignments in school and stuff to where <laughs> everything kind of started or sprang from. Um, so it's very automatic. Like, I don't... Um, I don't change my mind about a lot of things or hem and haw about the way it's supposed to flow. I try to just let it come out naturally. Um, so in that way, I just I try to get into this state of mind where I don't hurry and I don't hesitate. I just let the I try to keep my hand moving and let the tape just kind of form. Um, and to me, all that detail, like you know, drawing meticulous wallpaper or like wood grains on floors and carpet patterns and stuff like that, is all super. Uh, cathartic to me. Um, it's really relaxing, and I'll, I'll just—it kind of allows my mind to wonder, and um, 
sort of slows my, I think I'm kind of a manic thinker, and when I sit and draw repetitive patterns like that, it sort of slows everything down to a space where I can really um, let myself think. Um, so none, none of the pages ever really felt tedious to me. It was just kind of letting them have their own way. But I never know how long each one took, um, because they kind of, every page sort of took me by surprise. I would usually have five or six pages going at once, and I wouldn't always know the order they were going to end up in. Um, and there were a lot of pages where I would draw a whole sequence, and then I realized stuff had to happen between some of those panels, so I would end up cutting apart those panels. And uh, there's some things that started on the same page that are in separate books now. Mm. It's almost like collage, that sounds like. Yeah, yeah. If you look at the originals, like some of the pages are so thick with like layers of paper and, and glue that it got kind of ridiculous. Well, you know, it's not just the intricate details, but the color is incredible <laughs> in these. And, um, you know, as far as I understand it, you're the colorist for your comics as well. Are the, do you have any influences for for the for your sense of color? I'm just kind of curious about that aspect of your work. Um, yeah, I've definitely been more and more drawn to bright or intense kind of contrasting colors. Um, mm -hmm. in, in this, it definitely felt like the colors were an emotional layer. Um, and I, I used really limited colors in the first book, and then I, I gradually expand the palette uh, for the last book. Um, so it, it definitely definitely felt like everything was symbolic or had the like, colors ended up taking on meaning for me. Um, I'm not sure what the influences would, have, would be, uh, <laughs> just besides being really attracted to color. Um, it's, all, it's all hand colored, um, which ended up being kind of a nightmare for my publisher, I think, to print. <laughs> -colored stuff. And, and a lot of it ended up being really dark, kind of rich colors that I think are hard to capture. I was going to say, you know, one of the differences I've noticed between Understanding Monster books one and two and then the most recent three is the uh, the richness, almost the intensity of the color that comes out. It seems uh, much more vibrant in book three than it does the, the, the earlier two. Yeah, definitely. We were, we were kind of figuring that out as we went. But the paper we used for the first book sort of soaked up the ink in a weird way and made it a lot fuzzier than it should have been. Um, and then by the last book, that's mostly kind of sorted out. Um, but it sort of fit with the, with the theme of the book, too, because it's just sort of about coming out of a fog or um, kind of putting, like, coming out of a, a state of anxiety into a state of clarity. So the book sort of, uh, the printing kind of does that in its own way, too. Now, you know, you were talking uh, at the outset in, in trying to describe what the understanding monster is about or what's going on and, you know, psychological kind of inner inner journey, the subconscious, you know, all of those words came up. And one thing about all three of these uh, books, uh, The Understanding Monster, is that you have characters who have different manifestations and... I mean, right now, trying to recount what those are, I'm having a difficult time doing that, and and that, but that gets back to the very nature of this very unconscious, dreamlike nature of your story. In that, you know, um, one character at times, you know, clearly is a different representation. Or it has a different representation. For instance, the brain of one is in another body or robot. Um, and I mean, it may sound weird to our listeners, but you know, it makes sense once you get into your narrative. But sometimes figuring out what distinguishes one of the characters from another can get a little fuzzy. And again, very much like a, a dreamlike narrative. So, so I'm, I'm curious, um, you know, there's an emphasis on the inner world in your comics. Uh, do you rely much on your own dreams? Do you keep a dream diary? Do your dreams in any way kind of go into the comics that you create? Um, they definitely do, yeah. Um, there's, there's a number of dreams I've had. Um, but I guess dreams are hard to make into satisfying narratives because they usually cut off or something or they don't feel like a complete thing. 
but I've had dreams that I just really wanted to continue, so I turned them into a story. Um, where just like one little sequence of something kind of stays with me, and I find the impulse to draw it. Um, but like, I guess making comics itself sort of feels like having a, a lucid dream or something, or like actively engaging with that same space. Um, and something about the process of drawing, I'll end up remembering a lot of dreams while I work that I thought I'd forgotten. Um, so it, I, I definitely feel like it's this direct link or something. I'm wondering if you could tell us a little bit about your influences, the artists or the comics creators who you've turned to or who you think of when you look at your own work. Um, yeah, I, I relate to a lot of uh, a lot of the outsider artists, um, just in their, I guess, obsessive detail and a lot of the intricate work, like uh, mm-hmm. like Adolf Wolfe or Henry Darger, um, are both artists that I feel a really strong connection to. Um, uh, as far as comics go, I I love a lot of kind of the whole range of comics, but uh, mm-hmm. I've been really into a lot of the um, like art comics, like uh, stuff being published by like Space Facebook. Well, it's really interesting. Um, I really love Jim Woodring. I feel like he's maybe one of the modern-day cartoonists that's kind of dialed in the most thoroughly to his subconscious. Mm-hmm. Um, so anytime he puts out something, you like it pretty excited. I can definitely um, see uh, the you know the the Frank like links. Uh, going on in your comics, you know, in particular, un- the Understanding Monster. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, um, and I've, I've more recently gotten into uh, doing silent, uh, wordless comics too, which has been really satisfying. Um, I just had a, a little short comic called Birthday come out from the Latvian publisher uh, Kush Comics, um, and that's a completely wordless story that I, I did right after I finished. Monster. That's interesting because because one of the things that I really like about your comics actually are the the sort of wordplay between you and the the various manifestations of your inner mind. Tell us what you uh, what. Uh, so I'm kind of curious about um, sort of the experience of drawing silent comics. Well, thanks. I uh, yeah, I guess I guess the actual like work of the writing is the part that I felt the least secure about or something like something about my story just more and more feel like they're coming from this place where I don't have the language to describe it so it always feels awkward to put words there um but I've been kind of coming back to it now and doing a lot more writing which feels really good but uh it was really nice after the understanding monster to do a completely silent story um and just kind of embed it with all this symbology and uh really focus on just the, the flow of the story and the um, trying to make something be really fluent and readable without words. So it's definitely a really, really fun exercise. Great. Well, I will definitely have to check this out. You know, I guess one way of looking at the Understanding Monster, and, and I think, um, you know, Gwen was alluding to that, is that this is not only kind of a dreamlike... Uh, almost surreal it in in places uh exploration of imagination, but I guess your own inner self uh i mean do, do you do you consider the understanding monster uh to be n- not autobiographical but rooted I- very much in your own uh thought process and your psychology yeah definitely and it, it felt like something. That story in particular feels less like something I wrote and more like something I I went through, something I experienced and needed. So I I, I compulsively had to finish that story um, before, and I I feel like it brought me to a new place and opened things up for me. I feel like my approach and my connection to my imagination is stronger because of it. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, the story the story felt almost uncomfortably personal but most readers probably wouldn't look at it and think that but to me it's just I'm I'm like inside out on the page in that story and it, it 
it's almost uncomfortable um, to have people reading it in some ways. Mm-hmm. And that's kind of been my my kind of gut feeling after putting it out there. More a feeling of discomfort, which <laughs> is sometimes a yeah. good thing, I guess, because it means I I did something really honest that needed to come out. But yeah, it's not something I've and running around being like, everyone should read it. Yeah. Well, one of the reasons why I was asking about the connections to yourself and your own inner world is that in, in book three of The Understanding Monster, we have something that we don't have at least near as clearly in the first two books. And there, there are no page numbers, but I'm, I don't know, maybe about a quarter of the way in to Understanding Monster book three. And it's it's a page... It's a full-page panel where there's a dark silhouette figure, which I mean, I, I'm assuming to be some kind, uh, some figure representing you, and then uh, the red-headed, uh, I guess, monster, one of the monsters in the green suit, is hovering above him, and this silhouetted figure has a large mechanical egg, which reminds me of what you mentioned in one of the framing stories in your Capacity Collection, where you know you as a character mentioned that you take the guardian of your subconscious, a mechanical egg, uh, in order for him to let you through. And so you're holding in the understanding monster, or at least this silhouetted character is this mechanical egg, and and so the, to to me that was uh, probably the clearest way of you indicating that this is you somewhere in this narrative among the three understanding monster books. Yeah, it was like that moment was kind of like if you're having a dream and you wake up for a second from the fourth wall, kind of melts away, and then you remember everything about your life and then you kind of drift back into the dream or something. Mm-hmm. Um, and the, um, well, it, yeah, it, it, to me, the, they all directly connect. Like the whole premise of capacity was um, trying to gain full access to my subconscious without going insane was kind of the, <laughs> the line in that. Um, and then in the, the end of the book, I kind of, um, you know, have the reader imagine themselves as this character and kind of witness me climbing back into this other place. Um, so the, the idea was that that would somehow, um, you know, through having like a real person pretend their way into, into it and bear witness to it, it would make it real enough to be true inside of myself anyway. And then after that, I wrote the understanding monster and, um, yeah, I don't even know how to describe it, but <laughs> basically it, um, uh, the understanding monster literally was what happened after that. Um, when I would sit down to work, it seemed a lot more out of control and just all this imagery and all these characters started kind of filling out. Um, so the understanding monster was kind of me trying to make sense of that. So that story feels like a direct result of what I did um, with capacity. Well, you know, it's interesting because I had turned to this page as well. So maybe it's a testament to the strength of <laughs> of that of the power of that page. But one thing that I noticed was the the little creature who's rubbing the character's back and saying, "Stay calm, so close." And it reminded me of many times in all three volumes where collaboration and cooperation is emphasized. Could you talk a little bit about that in your work? Yeah, and in, in that story, I definitely, I have, there's, I mean, it takes place in this living house, which is sort of like the body or the mind or something, and then inside of it are all these different characters. Some of them are in the walls, and some of them are kind of, exist off panel that are able to influence what's happening. Mm-hmm. Um, and it, to me, it sort of re- represented all the negative and positive voices in our own head. Right. Um, and, the, and the way they influence us, and which ones we let in and which ones we have to kind of guard ourselves against and move forward with or which ones to ignore. Um, so I've got all those kind of creatures in the walls that are kind of negative energies trying to influence things. And then um, the, um, the robot character that's constantly morphing is sort of this positive character that's trying to see everything through but isn't really able to 
actually physically um, change, cause changes or effects. So it's basically just the positive voice in your head, hoping that you'll respond in a good way. Mm. Hmm. Well, I really love the mood of it. It's really lovely. Oh, thanks. Well, there is this tone of tenderness that runs throughout. And in fact, uh, the only times in the Understanding Monster series where things get a little scary and potentially violent is when um, – oh, what are they called? The, uh, the, the ugly kids or the nasty kids? The mean kids. Right. The mean kids yeah, are – yeah, are uh, bubbling up from, from underneath, so to speak. And you know, we see them – you know, little tips of them. So to, uh, every now and again, uh, but that—that's about as rough as it gets. Everything else seems to be much more cooperative. Um, yeah, definitely. I guess I was mostly interested in trying to create a, a sense of harmony. Or, I mean, the book is about trying to reach sort of a harmonious space inside of myself, where I can interact with my own imagination and create work fluently. Um, and then the mean kids are just sort of this outside presence. Or um, I saw them as kind of these um, once beneficial kind of spirits that have some kind of disease and have sort of become that way. But towards the end, it was it was sort of about trying to unplug that connection inside of myself. I guess mm-hmm. I don't know. I always feel like I'm saying really strange things when I try to talk about this book. But <laughs> 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 that's, how it, that's how it was. <laughs> well, it's, it, it, it strikes me uh, similar ways to trying to describe or and even explain the inner life. You know, you know we, we can articulate certain lines of thought that are going through our head, but experiences, feelings, I mean, many times those are amorphous. To, to try to put those in some kind of clearly defined tangible means to someone else is not the easiest thing. Uh, to me, that's like uh, trying to wrap your brain around the understanding monster. <laughs> yeah, I mean that's that's definitely what it was for me. It was uh, you know a real attempt to step as far back as, as I could into that and come back with something. Um, and to me, like I guess just from so much automatic drawing and doodling, um, I feel like it's almost like if you just sit and draw a picture in straight pen with no idea what you're going to draw, it's sort of like a um, like the way a seismograph depicts an earthquake or something. Um, you're giving your thought process some kind of physical form, even if it's totally abstract. It represents what was going on back there. So it's kind of like a way of seeing what's happening inside of yourself. Um, so I got really into like that concept of it being almost like photographs of your, that you can bring back from a place you can't actually see. Um, yeah. And I... I kind of I started making comics initially because whenever I would draw a picture, I would have this kind of haunted feeling that there was something that happened before that picture and something that happened after it. Um, and I always wanted to know more about the characters and their recurring themes. Um, and it was always hard to wrap my mind around. And something about making comics sort of unlocked it and allows you to kind of walk around the different corners and imagine what's there. That's a really lovely way to put it. Mm-hmm. Oh, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Now, you know, when we've been talking about the understanding monster, um, I've noticed that for the most part you're using the past tense. Um, does that mean that there's not going to be uh, uh, the understanding monster book four? Um, there's, there's just going to be three of them. Okay. Um, but uh, the, some of the stuff I'm... One of the things I'm working on right now still continues uh, to examine what I started with that. Um, I feel like, well, capacity and the understanding monster feel like there's the same part of the story. Um, and then there's a third one that will kind of complete those as almost like a trilogy. So uh, the understanding monster is a trilogy within a trilogy. Yeah, no way. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I don't know how many people will follow it that way, but for me, it's, it's in my own my own artistic process that is that was kind of the crazy middle thing that 
happened out of capacity. Uh, and then the thing I'm working on now, or I've been slowly kind of working on, is um, sort of my way of turning around and viewing all that from a new kind of standpoint. Hmm. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I should really try to veer away from trilogies within trilogies, <laughs> but that's how... <laughs> Well, I was asking about the possibility of a fourth um, understanding monster because at the very end, and this is not a spoiler for those listening at home uh, or wherever you're listening, in that, you know, when uh, the last panel of the story proper, we have your character Minnow, and she's in uh, and talking to Bodie Boat Boat, and I love the name. Uh, and at, in that panel, you end with the word so, and then there's an ellipsis. Uh, so one way of reading that so is that there's going to be a continuation, if not in the Understanding Monster Book 4, then I guess in this next project that you just alluded to? Yeah, I um, I sort of did that at the end just to, because I feel like everything, like those, all those characters' trajectories are still going whether I write about them or not. Um, but I would like to go in and I would love to write a book just about that character. Um, Minnow? Yeah. So I don't, I mean, who knows? I might end up being a fourth one that <laughs> ends up happening, but I sort of feel like the future ones will be sort of their own standalone books. It'll be more focused. I don't know if my future stories will be quite the, um, the mess of... <laughs> what these books had to be. Like, mm. I feel like that was an experience I needed to have and now I'm trying to really, um, I don't know, I, I ended up starting like five different books after I finished the Understanding Monster and now I'm trying wow. to figure out which ones that I should um, focus on and finish this year and trying to map out what I should do. <laughs> but, uh, right now I'm working on a, a gallery show that's going to be in Los Angeles uh, Next month. Great. Uh, once, once, once all that's done, I'm going to come back and really dive back into comics and see what needs to come out and all that. And that's yeah. where you're originally from, Los Angeles? Um, yeah, I was actually born down there, um, but I grew up in Montana. Um, but I've, for the last uh, five years, I've had an annual uh, solo show at Giant Robot down there. Well, our West Coast Perfect. listeners, I hope, will have a chance to see it. <laughs> uh, thanks. And, and, and when will it be now? Um, it's going to be on uh, February 13th. Oh, wow. Yeah. Just in a few weeks. So my, yeah. So one of the walls of my studio is filled with my woodcut art that I do. I've been working away on that. Theo, have you moved at all into any kind of computer work or... Is that something that you've resisted, or? Um, I, I mean, I'm not totally against it, but I, for me, I just, I, I just really enjoy the tactile, hands-on mm -hmm. kind of experience. Um, I don't even have internet or a computer in my studio. It's sort of my, my computer-free zone. Um, I don't, have, I don't know. I, I just think my enjoyment levels go down if I use the computer too much. Right. Um, I just love working with real ink and with, with my uh, gallery shows I, I cut out all the wood myself and do I draw characters on shapes of wood oh, okay that sounds lovely but, uh, yeah sometimes I think about computer coloring um, because it might not be as messy or it might uh, <laughs> and be easier to be easier to print <laughs> and, but uh, I, I don't know I, a friend sat me down once and started showing me how to computer color, color and I was just like, man, I would just be unhappy the whole time I was doing this. Whereas I enjoy working with colored ink and markers and watercolor and stuff. So. I'm wondering if when you were a younger person or even now, if you've had an interest in maps or diagrams, because one of my favorite pages in the third volume is the one that uh, is the, um, as you're sort, sort of saying, what do I need to understand? And then, um, uh, you know, just this beautiful little diagram comes out with little numbers and, and different color codes for the um, for the fly and everything. Could you? Is there an influence there for you? Oh, definitely. I've, I've always loved like maps and schematics. Um, 
And I remember as a kid trying to trying to draw like uh, like cross sections of submarines and stuff like that. Um, yeah, when I was a kid, I was the same way. I was obsessed with maps, with the in- internal workings of things, and so this has been so lovely to look at for that reason. I could def- I- I'm I'm pleased to see you say that because you can really feel that influence. Oh, cool. Yeah, I I love uh, I don't know just being able to peel back things and see what things are made of. Um, I like I don't know. I, I guess with comics, I really want to be able to do that more with like being able to show like a thought process or the way um, all the different um, connections in the mind go and the different associations lead someone to a specific idea to be able to map that out and so that kind of progression I think would be really satisfying to do with comic. And it, it really helps to ground what's going on as well in some of the more complicated parts of the comic. Um, that's one thing I'll say is that when you're moving from panel to panel, it's I was never confused about that. I might I was telling Derek there were points where I felt a little lost, but then I came back in. Um, but I never felt lost in the comic. Um, so you know it's it's really a joy to read in in that respect and you know i really want to urge our our listeners to to get a copy of theo's work because you know you're hearing us talk about it but you really need to see it 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 defies my ability to really describe it well but it's amazing once you have it in front of you yeah and, and as an example of that um you know last night i was sitting on the couch with my wife and I was looking through some of your books again to prepare for the, uh, the interview today, and I had – I can't remember which book it was of The Understanding Monster, but uh, I, I was looking at one, and there was one another one right beside me. And then my wife picked it up, and she said, oh, what's this? And sh- she was drawn, I think, both to the size of the book, you know, what, what Gwen alluded to earlier, uh, but also the colors. And then when she looked at it, the art. Now, now she is not really a comics reader. She reads some, but very limited in what she will read. Um, and I thought she was just going to pick up the book, flip a couple of pages, and then put it back down. But then she opened it and became almost immediately mesmerized by the intricate and colorful art, and she just got lost in it. Now, she she didn't read it through in any kind of linear manner, but she was going from page to page, and she held on to it for a very long time, just uh, making comments like, oh, my God, look at this. I can't believe it. And she kept making those kind of comments. And so, you know, again, she's a non-comics reader. I mean, she she will read something, but she doesn't normally. But she picked up your book, and she was in the Understanding Monster Zone for at least a good three or four minutes. Oh, cool. And I think it's it's very much – I mean, that's – to me, almost um, representative of the experience of reading The Understanding Monster. I, I didn't feel that way as much with the Capacity book, uh, you know, that collection, which, which which I want to get to in a moment. Uh, but with The Understanding Monster, it's it's an immersive experience. Once you commit yourself to the story, then you get into a world where – it's not going to necessarily make sense with what's going on in the outside non-textual world, but, but that really doesn't matter because it has its own strange kind of logic, but you just get sucked into that world and you're there and it just feels like it's, it's a, it's like jumping into water. You're, you know, it's, it's, it's comfortable enough. You're waiting around and it's a unique experience. Oh, cool. Thanks. That's, uh, that's really nice. To know. I'm never sure how they're going to be taken, but for me, it was a really immersive experience and felt really personally important while I was working on it. Um, and as far as like the f- flow of the pages goes, like that, I feel like that was the thing that really um, I was really starting to figure out or understand about comics. Um, just trying to design pages that flowed well and would take you through them without. Um, getting lost. Like I wanted every page to almost have kind of a a guide or a, a pathway that you walk to get through the page. You can so I kind of exploded the whole like panel thing for most of the book. Um, 
Yeah, you do that so well, especially because there's no white space in the comic, the, uh, in the traditional sense. But there's the there are these wonderful backgrounds, and I'm looking at um, a page again. We don't really have the numbers. This is towards the end when. Um, your character is in the room, which has all of the pictures of the the guy in the scream, and it's wall the wallpaper is the scream. <laughs> it's a great page, and um, there's there's a, there's four panels that I can see on the actual page, but then there's this wonderful backdrop as well. And so you know, when I first picked it up and I was starting to read it, I thought you know usually I use the white space as a way of sort of grounding myself, but I felt very much that there was a lot of ease moving from panel to panel because the backgrounds sort of just hold everything together or it's almost like your eyes are being directed as to where to look um It's really lovely oh thanks yeah I ended up fully obliterating any sense of white space on every page. Like I, <laughs> I ended up drawing, drawing all the way to the end of every page. Um, uh-huh. And I rounded, rounded the corner. So like every, every page in there is actually the entire piece of paper, like floating there on the page. Um, wow. I don't know why exactly it had to be done that way, but that's just sort of how it worked out. <laughs> Now, you mentioned that with the Understanding Monster, you use the word um, guide, uh, that your art in, in several ways works as a guide on, on how to read the page. But in places, it's almost as if we have almost a literal guide because there are certain characters that every now and again will tell another character to do something, which is, is really a command or a recommendation for what the reader should do. And sometimes there is this almost, I guess, a disembodied voice that is telling the reader, you know, turn the page, you know, or press one, two, or three. Are you ready? Little mm-hmm. things like that. And, and you could, I mean, you, you see that also in your in your capacity stories as well. Yeah, I, I definitely like to, I guess, play around with the role of the reader. And something about reading comics is such a direct, in, intimate link to the author. Um, I guess if I sit down with a comic and I'm usually sitting in a quiet place and it's just me and the book, so it sort of becomes like I'm stepping into this other author's um, kind of dream. And mm-hmm. and you really get to see, I, I, I feel like comics pages really show the way um, a cartoonist's mind works, the way their pages flow and um, the way they deliver information. Um, and just having gotten to know a number of cartoonists, I always feel like um, reading their work and knowing them as an individual, they start, it starts making sense that that's how their comics turn out. Mm-hmm. Um, and it definitely, yeah, the comics definitely represent the way I think and what was going on inside of me at that time. Um, and for me, it's like even when the kind of details or the words of the story um, felt like this jumble in my head, something about the visual pathway through the story always felt this, like this um, natural impulse or something. It was kind of uh, guiding me at the same time. I felt like those I was just as dependent on those character guides in the story as as the character that you tell through the story. Yeah, I I totally see that. It's just amazing. You know, I, w- I want to uh, talk a, a little bit about your book Capacity. Uh, now, the I guess the original seven issues of Capacity. Uh, were, there were many comics, and then you collected those along with uh, some new material. I guess that's primarily the the framing material in in the book capacity that came out in two thousand eight. And then, you know, as we mentioned at the top of the show, you have this new edition of, or at least a new printing of capacity that came out in October of last year. Um, was the October twenty fifteen edition? In essence, the same, just a new printing, or were was there additional material? Because I know you have issue eight of capacity out as well. Yeah, yeah, that was kind of a unexpected continuation. But uh, the the new edition uh, is basically just a nicer a nicer edition. It, it doesn't have any alterations in it or any added material. I definitely thought about it, adding like a whole continuing ending to it, but uh, 
I had to read this back because I was trying to finish the Understanding Monster Book 3 in time. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, that, um, capacity is definitely, like, that, that's my first published book, and it also is some of my first comics are in there. Um, it was me kind of, the, um, the original series that ran through seven issues that I just put out myself, um, was me kind of just trying to figure out what comics can do um, and see what kind of stories I wanted to tell and what was going on in there and just trying to free myself up to um, do bigger things with it. Um, and then when Secret Acres contacted me and wanted to put out a collection, I ended up drawing over 100 extra pages. Um, and it really felt like that, that, that book captures like a five-year period of my life and it really feels like that encapsulates this really specific um, stage of my progress. Did you feel that... Oh, I'm sorry. Did you feel that adding that additional material, the, you know, 100 plus uh, pages uh, to the original seven issues of Capacity, that that helped to put those mini comics, those originally original self-published mini comics into a different perspective or context for you? Yeah, it did. I, I felt like it was really important. Um, and for me, some, some of the, the extra stuff I added is, is what really brought it together to me or helped me um, really understand that period of my life um, and understand all the kind of symbologies and themes I was working with while I was making those. Uh, those seven issues were just me, like, like every... Initially, whenever I would sit down and try to write comics, I feel like my brain would go so many different directions at once, and I would just not be able to really put anything down on paper. Um, so that that series was me trying to just finally put something down. So each issue was just a, it was filled with short pieces and things that came out on the fly. Um, just something that occurred to me while I was riding my bike or something. Um, and then adding all these all these other stories, um, this bigger kind of framing context um, really helped me see what I was doing, I guess. Um, so there's all this autobiographical stuff in there mixed with total fantasy, which um, feels pretty close to the way my life is, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> so there was that... Um... Issue number eight of Capacity that came out in, what was it, was it 2013? Um, I think so. Okay. Um, is, is there going to be uh, an issue number nine of Capacity? Will you will you continue this series on? Um, I'm not totally sure yet. But number eight was kind of a, was kind of an accident, I guess. It was a, I just was working on a story and then suddenly I was like, this could be. Number eight, and I and I brought back in the um, the character that I had the reader imagine themselves as. Were they filling um, their name? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so I don't know. There could be. I'm, I'm definitely not uh, not just counting it. But back when it came out, I I was at uh, TCAP in Toronto, and someone asked me if there's going to be more issues, and I said no. And then my publisher leaned forward and said, "Yes, there will be." <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know. <laughs> you might know better than I. <laughs> well, what about your relationship with Secret Acres? H- how did that relationship come about? Um, I uh, well, it, it started, well, the first the first uh, show I ever went to was uh, the Alternative Press Festival in San Francisco, and. Uh, that was the first time I'd ever just like put my work out there and had a table with my self-published stuff. Um, and at that show, I met uh, Tony Shenton, who's a he's kind of a one-man distro um, for uh, self-publishers, and he works for a lot of big companies too. But he was basically he basically started uh, um, getting my work into comic shops uh, that have like an indie like self-published section. Um, so I got an order for. It might have been Forbidden Planet in New York. Um, ordered some of my work, and uh, uh, Barry and Leon, who 
informed Secret Acre uh, found my work just in a comic shop and sent me a letter saying they were starting a publishing company. So I was uh, one of the first people on board. Um, I think I was happy with their third book. Um, yeah, and I, I, I really like their aesthetic and their kind of mission for the, the kind of comics that they're putting out. Um, from the beginning, they, they wanted to put out more idiosyncratic um, kind of work from authors that do do everything, do all the writing and drawing and themselves. Uh, but yeah, they've been they've been fun to work with. And great this people, is a, you know. a beautiful. It's a work of art, really, and um, it's wonderful to know that there are publishers who are willing to make that kind of investment. Yeah, it's nice that um, they they really want the artists to design their own books and really put out something personal that really represents them, which uh, mm-hmm. can be all too rare, for sure. Yeah, absolutely. So it's really it's a testament to their awesomeness, really. <laughs> <laughs> Now, if our listeners wanted to find out more about your work, I mean, in addition to looking your book up uh, at various bookstores online and otherwise, uh, they can go to your blog, and that's Thought Cloud Factory, correct? Uh, yeah, my, my blog is just com. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, I have a Thought Cloud Factory website that's uh, kind of out of date, but... If you went on to thoughtcloudfactory.com, that would also lead you to my blog. Because <laughs> I see that there's a link both to your blog and also to Etsy where people can get your books. Yeah, yeah. I have a lot of um, just self-published uh, books of stream of conscious drawings that I, I keep um, and print and stuff like that. Yeah. Including the aforementioned birthday. The silent, wordless right. comic. Yeah, yeah, that's on there. <laughs> <laughs> well, Theo, um, you told us a little bit about you know the um, the exhibition and then some works that you have uh, th- th- that you're working on right now. Uh, is there anything that we can expect in, uh, published in I don't know the coming twelve months? Um, I hope so. I um, kind of the next thing I want to make. Um, well, I have I have a number of comics in the works that I'm I'm kind of making up as I go, and I don't know how long they'll take. I'm just kind of giving them their time, I guess. Um, but one thing I want to do when I get back from this gallery show is uh, write my first children's book. Oh wow! Oh yay! Um, which, would, <laughs> which would be um, you know kind of a in comics form to. Um, where I really want to be able to merge the words and pictures and make something really fluent. Um, I have I have two kids, two young kids, so I, I've been reading a lot of stories out loud, um, and that's really been getting me. Like, I guess I've been kind of intimidated about writing children's books because they, they seem like they have to be so precise and so specific or something, and um, I finally feel like I'm getting my head around how to do it. Um, just after reading so many children's stories out loud over and over again every night, um, it's <laughs> really helped, it's helped me like tune into what stories are kind of a pain to read and which ones I never get tired of. Um, and just the way you have to word things so it just feels really fluent and not tedious, you know, because it's going to be read aloud by parents and you want the parents to kind of be on board with the story too, you know. Um, so I just want to write something really, really fun and strange that, I'll definitely be directly inspired by my kids. Um, that's I'm so excited. <laughs> that's wonderful oh, because thanks. you know, well, also because a lot of the 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 characters, especially in the first book, um, remind me a lot of characters you might find in a children's book. And in fact, some of them are like toys and are toys. So it would be wonderful mm-hmm. to see that world explored in more depth for young readers. Andy Wolverton and I do a show for uh, comics for young readers, so we'll we'll keep a lookout for your title. Oh, thanks. <laughs> I've been I've been actually making uh, collaborative comics with my four year old too. Oh wow! That's really fun. Keeping um, it in the family, my friend. <laughs> yeah, 
and that's, that's definitely helped me uh, think about children's books, too. Because um, we, we, we finished a story called Werewolf Fireman Friend. That's uh, completely dictated by my four-year-old. Well, he was three at the time, actually. Um, so he, he dictated it, and I drew it in straight ballpoint pen. Um, and it was a lot of fun. Wow. That sounds I, great. I, if you guys email me your address, I'll send you copies. Oh, okay. Great. Awesome. You know, and in fact, your style really lends itself to younger readers. Uh, I mean, I'll be honest. When I mean, I knew your work capacity, but I didn't know until last fall the Understanding Monster. And so when I first looked at Understanding Monster and saw – well, first off, the size of the book – uh, and then the art, and then the title of itself, you know, not just a monster, but it's a monster who understands. I thought, I wonder if this is a book for younger readers. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think a lot of people think that when I pick it up, and I'm, I don't know what, what kids are going to think. <laughs> like, sorry, I'm not traumatizing. Anymore, <laughs> I really love the idea of making something for it really is for kids that can um, kind of engage with them on, on multiple levels. Um, well, yeah, you know, know actually, Maury Sindak has often said, and, and you could almost compare your work to his in a way, um, because he, too, has always been interested in exploring the inner lives of children. And, you know, where the wild things are has been critiqued in the past because some readers have felt it was, you know, too graphic or too violent for children or too frightening. And, you know, Sindak pushed back and said, hey, life is frightening. It's frightening for everyone. Kids know that. They're not unaware. And so I don't – I actually – what I was thinking when I was looking at this is I have a little cousin whom I want to share this book with um, because Understanding Monster, because I know that he would love it. He has a very analytical mind. Um, he's always interested in expressing how he feels um, through drawing, and I think that he would adore this book. So, But the idea of you creating a book specifically for kids would be exciting, too. Oh, thanks. That, that is hopefully exactly what I will do when I... <laughs> everywhere that's kind of the, the main project um, yeah great well Theo I want to thank you for taking the time and talking with us on the Comics Alternative and uh, you know great work with the Understanding Monster and then it's good to know that these uh, other projects are coming up and again to remind our listeners uh, uh, February when did you say the uh, the gallery was uh, the 13th. The 13th in Los Angeles. Yeah. And, and what is the location? Uh, it's at, at uh, Giant Robot. <laughs> is the name of the gallery. That's, a, that's appropriate, given the understanding monster. Yeah. <laughs> yep. <laughs> well, thanks a lot, Theo. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. I really appreciate getting to talk to you guys. Thanks, Theo. Take care. You too. Wow, Derek, that was a great conversation. So wonderful to talk with Theo and to learn more, not only about his past projects, but about some of the things that he's planning to do in the future. I really hope Andy and I get to review one of his uh, children's comics very soon. Yeah, that'd be great. Uh, And, you know, one of the things that struck me about this conversation, Gwen, is when we were asking him how he would describe the understanding monster to someone and the kind of loose, fuzzy way of it being an interior Interior tale of some sort going into the psyche is very much what you and I had thought it was. Kind of, kind of hard to to put into words, but it's definitely a feeling there. Absolutely. And it's the sort of thing where even if you don't identify with everything that's going on on a particular page, the beauty of the art draws you in. So from a technical standpoint, it's also really a wonderful comic. 
Yeah. Again, I come back to the word immersive. I just think that yeah. that that goes a long way of describing the experience of reading The Understanding Monster. And, you know, if you want to find great books like The Understanding Monster, unfortunately, they do not have it on their website. But you can find other great comics at our sponsor's website, which is Discount Comic Book Service. If you go to DCBService.com, you're going to find a lot of great discounts. And then as you're waiting for those comics to get to you, brew up a great cup of coffee by going to Just Coffee Co-op and ordering some. It's a great place to get caffeinated if you go to their website, justcoffee.coop. And at checkout, use the coupon code COMICS. You'll get 10% off of your order. Plus, shipping is always free. That's right. And Derek, remember, they do have chocolate, too. That's right. We cannot, and you will not let us forget, that I they will have not. Cho- chocolate. <laughs> And after you do get your comics, coffee, and chocolate, get in touch with us and let us know what you're going to be reading, drinking, and nibbling on. If you go to our website, comicsalternative.com, you'll find that you can leave us a voice message through the wonders of SpeakPipe. Or you can call us the old-fashioned way. Our phone number is 415-3-COMICS. That's 415-326-6427. You know at what else they could do? They could contact us by email at two guys at comicsalternative.com or you can get in touch with us individually. I'm Gwen at comicsalternative.com. Derek, how can they reach you? I'm Derek at comicsalternative.com. That's right. And you can also find us on Twitter where we announce new content to our podcast and updates to our blog. And there we are at two, the number two, guys with PhDs. That's right. But we're also other places on social media such as Facebook, Tumblr, Instagram, Google+, Pinterest, and Goodreads. We also have a YouTube channel, so check us out that way. You can subscribe to the podcast through iTunes. You can stream us on Stitcher. You can also find us on TuneIn. But you can find every single one of our episodes as well as our reviews and the comics-related commentary that we post on our blog. And that's at our website, comicsalternative.com. Well, until next time, I'm Gwen. And I'm Derek. Take care. Bye.